Okay, so again, thank you everybody for taking the time to join us today. Truly appreciate it. And as Suzanne said, my name is Tammy Cloutiers and I just wanna welcome you to this presentation titled Canids of Maine, Vixens or Villains? So a little bit about myself and Suzanne already touched on this. Um, born and raised in Maine, currently wear three hats, one as an ethologist and then a writer and an editor as well. My passion has always revolved around animals and that reflected in my volunteer experience as well as my educational background, which is in animal behavior, wildlife science and human wildlife interactions. My PhD work was done on painted dogs or as other people know them as African wild dogs in Zimbabwe, but I've always wanted to learn more about our canids closer to home. So here we are today. So this presentation is divided into three sections. I'll start by talking about just some generalities about the canids that reside here. We'll touch on human canid interactions, and then we'll wrap it up with the community science project. So here we go. Maine is home to three canid species. From left to right, you see the red fox, the gray fox, and the coyote. Gray fox doesn't seem to garner as much attention as the red foxes and the coyotes who are usually unfairly portrayed as just cunning, shady, sexy even, and villainous. All three species share a common ancestor with the gray fox lineage predating the red foxes and the coyotes. And two areas of similarities are their diet and their life cycles. So again, all three species are omnivores and this just means that their diet ranges from fruit and nuts all the way up to mammals and carrion. So they have a seasonal variability depending on what happens to be available to them at that time and location. Some literature indicates that the gray foxes have a more plant-based and diverse diet and red, than red foxes and coyotes, but it's uncertain if that's the case in Maine because there's a lack of research in that area. As for life cycle, all three species are considered monogamous. Their breeding season falls in that time frame between December and March, so we're in the thick of it now for them. They all use dens, and dens can be a brush pile, a rock crevice, a hollow log, a steep bank, or of course, I'm sure some of you may be familiar, human structures, since they seem to be sturdy, safe places for them to hide. But they also create additional den sites in case that primary den gets disturbed and they will reuse a den year after year if they think it's safe to do so. So fox kits and coyote pups are born in the spring about 50 to 60 days uh, later after just 50 to 60 day gestation period, there we go. Usually in the month of March, April and May and the average litter size for them is three to six but of course that will vary depending on other circumstances as well. So you see this top picture here, those are red fox kits and they're born with a charcoal colored coat that starts to change at around five weeks of age. And then at around 10 weeks, they start to get that more typical adult coat color. Our little gray fox kit right here in the middle, they can hunt on their own and they're independent by seven months of age. And then our little coyote pups on the bottom have their permanent teeth and are almost full to grown by about six months of age. And it's not unusual to see them out as a family hunting at that time as they learn to figure things out on their own. So come fall and early winter, some of these individuals will disperse and go out on their own to find um, their own territories. Some may stay back with the parents and hang out and support other litters in the future. And as for lifespan, in captivity, the red foxes have been known to live up to 12 years grays up to 15 and coyotes up to 18. Unfortunately in the wild, they don't nearly hit that, that lifespan being that six years of age may be old for them in the wild. So in addition to diet and life cycle, canids also share a common hunting method and that is the pounce. So they will listen for their prey, whether it's in deep snow or in tall grass, and then they leap up and land on their prey. And some of those leaps can range from two to six feet. So these guys are pretty athletic. And again, in the interest of time, super quick overview of some of the diff uh, similarities. So now we'll just touch on some of the differences just so you can get to know these guys a little better. So this is just a ta this table just shows brief overview of comparison of weight, size, distribution, and some of those physical traits. But I'll touch on these a little bit as I talk about each of the species. So we will start with the red fox. 
And the North American red fox is native to the U.S., although European subspecies were introduced to the East Coast in Canada in about the 17th century. And there was some hybridization, but based on the evidence that we know at this point, it doesn't seem as though that hybridization was widespread. Red foxes weigh between seven and 15 pounds, and you can see that they typically have this reddish, reddish orange uh, coat color, but there are variations. And those variations are called melanistic forms or morphs. And you can see two examples here with this black silver morph, and then this red black cross right here. Red foxes also have some felid or cat-like traits, including vertical slip pupils instead of the round pupils. And you can see that right there. They also have sensory hairs on their muzzle and their forelegs. And one theory about the red foxes having these cat-like traits is that they co-evolved with some kind of cat-like animal. And these adaptations help them compete in that environment at that time. Red foxes found throughout the state can commonly see them in agricultural or edge areas. So those wide open spaces that are next to or adjacent to a more forested area, but they do adapt to other situations as well, including neighborhoods and cities. And I couldn't find any information on red foxes in Maine, but other research shows that their home ranges can average between six and 12 square miles. And that, of course, that based on habitat quality, food availability, and other factors. So now we're gonna take a quick look at the gray fox. Gray foxes are also native to North America. They fall at about that mid-weight range of a red fox, about 12-ish pounds, nine, 10, oh, sorry, 12 is not in the mid-range, nine, 10 pounds or thereabouts. And you can see they're a bit shorter and stockier than a red fox. That grizzled coloration that you see right here is a mix of white, black, gray, and red fur. And they have that, again, that elongated torso and those shorter legs in comparison to the reds. Some variation in that gray as well, but not to the extent that we typically see in the red foxes. Can usually find grays in brushy, shrubby, or deciduous forest. And here in Maine, they're usually in the southern, central, and mid-coast regions, although there have been recitings that have been recorded in the Moosehead Lake region, and even New Brunswick, Canada recorded various sightings over the years. But we're at the northernmost of their range, so they don't typically go in the deeper snow, but that may be changing as conditions change as well. And again, couldn't find any research on the home ranges for our guys here in Maine, but elsewhere their home ranges can average from less than one square mile up to about seven square miles. And one final note, while red foxes can do some climbing, grays have a greater level of front leg, front leg rotation and semi-retractable claws that allow them to climb up and down trees. And again, that could be related to that co-evolution that some researchers speculate about where they co-evolved with cats. So this has made them more adaptable at that time. But I do have a video that will show an example of that rather than me just describing it to you. So let me see if it will allow me to share. And it may not. Just... Hmm. This one here. Is everyone able to see gray fox kits on their screen? Yes. I hope, I hope. Yes. Okay. So it's just these little guys in it. This was taken in Texas, but I couldn't find any main footage, unfortunately. In late summer of 2016. And I know it doesn't look like late summer for central Texas, but it is. A mother gray fox brought these five fox kits into our backyard one day. And it seemed like she had just taken them out for an ice cream and they were on a sugar high. And they kind of hung around and played a little bit for, for a while here, but then got going on this one straight up cedar tree. And they got to play in tag and you're it, and I'm gonna bite you and wrestle you and run up this tree. And, and they were just going crazy. Mm. 
Okay, so you didn't see evidence of them climbing down a tree, but you can certainly see how they scale it and then they just love to leap off after. Just shows how agile they are. Whoop, now we're back to this, okay. Okay, so I didn't want to crowd this slide up anymore. So let's go on to the third canid and that is the coyote. This is our biggest, heaviest canid here in Maine. And here they're about 10 pounds heavier than their Western counterparts. There have been anecdotal reports of them being 60 to 80 pounds, but they're generally less than 50. Although looking at some of these pictures, you can see how that full thick winter coat can definitely make them appear larger than what they are. But also, Individuals have varying levels of, or varying percentages, I should say, of wolf DNA in them. So that can also be reflected in their physical appearance, making them a little bit bigger than what we would typically think the size of a coyote should be. And as you can see here too, they have coat variations as well. They can range from light blonde to a darker gray, darker brown, and even to a black. So coyotes were first documented here in Maine in the 1930s but sightings began to increase in the 1960s and the 1970s. And now you can find them throughout the state, whether it's on farmland in urban areas, forests, and even on islands. And like foxes, they do have territories, but again, unsure of the range of our coyotes here in Maine, but other literature shows them ranging from about two square miles to 11 or more square miles for a home territory. And there is disagreement about whether coyotes should be labeled as native or non-native or invasive, but they are native to North America, just like the red and gray foxes. And just like the foxes, they adjust their range naturally as they adapt to conditions such as the killing off of wolves, altered landscapes, climate change, just that sheer ability they have to seemingly adapt to any surrounding that they come into. So this image here, just shows some of the estimated original ranges that they thought where coyotes started from. So in the 1950s, you have this dotted gray line that shows them from Canada all the way down to Mexico and then Midwest to the West Coast. For some reason in the 1990s, research in the 1990s really restricted that range. So it showed them as actually originating more from central US, but more recent research, 2018-ish, uh, shows this solid black line, which again is closer to that, that original estimate from Canada down to Mexico, possibly further, and then mid Central America to that West Coast again. There have been two natural expansion ranges, one to the Northeast, which brought them up here and mixed and mingled them with our wolf populations up here, and then one to the Southeast, which is bringing them down into more red wolf territory, Georgia, Florida, in that section. Okay, so let me see if I can do this without losing everyone. So I'm just gonna play a few snippets of vocalizations from each of these species. And maybe you're already familiar with what they sound like, or maybe you've heard one and you weren't entirely sure what you were listening to. So we'll see if this matches up with anything any of you recognize. Hopefully, let's see. Give a second. Oh, not playing at all. Okay. My tech is not being super friendly with me today. Okay, let me do this. So that was our red fox. And now a little bit from our gray.
before we get to the coyote, um, just to know, I have a friend who's a conservation photographer and she captured this video while she was out and about. And I thought it might be a fun way, not only to listen to what a coyote sounds like, but also to explain the Bogest effect or demonstrate the Bogest effect, which I'll explain for those of you who may not be familiar with that term. So just take a listen and think about how many coyotes you might actually hear howling here. I don't know. I don't know if this would have fooled anybody, but if you can throw it in the chat, you can shout out an answer. But about how many coyotes do you think that sounded like? Oops. Let me get back to the screen here. So for those who weren't fooled, that was only three coyotes that were making that noise. And the bow jest effect is just an auditory illusion, meaning they're able to amplify their voices and change their voices. And you heard the yipping and the yapping and the howling and kind of coincide all that together to make it sound like there are more individuals than what they are. And part of that, we believe, is an adaptation to make it sound like there are more individuals, whether it's to scare off other predators or other perhaps coyote family groups. So that's just a general overview of our three resident canids, but I do have one more to mention, and that is the Eastern or Algonquin wolf. So there's a lot of debate about wolves here in Maine and their hybridization with coyotes, and there's no official acknowledgement of resident wolf packs here in Maine, but individuals have been known to come into our state over the years. And two notable cases were a 63 pound female that arrived on her own in 1993 and an 85 and a half pound male that came in 1996. Unfortunately, both were killed, and then it was discovered that they were wolves. It is illegal to kill a wolf, and there are individuals and organizations who are currently working on genetic research to understand more about our northeastern canids and their genetic makeup up here. So just a couple of quick comparisons before we move on to human canid interactions. And from left to right, you see a gray fox, a red fox, a coyote, that's their size comparison in comparison to a six foot tall human. And then this graphic is just a quick representation of how they compare to one another. So you have our slightly shorter, stockier gray fox, red fox, and then our coyotes. And of course the gray wolf, which we do not have up here, at least to our knowledge. And I also wanted to mention this handy little resource too. So Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has this little pocket guide to animal tracks. And you can use this if you happen to be out and about to help differentiate between canid tracks out there or other wildlife tracks as well. I got mine at the Maine Wildlife Park for those who are familiar with that, that location, um, but I have seen them elsewhere and you can actually download it as a PDF from the Department of Inland Fishery and Wildlife's website. And if you don't wanna carry around a handy little tool, I just took a tracking workshop, winter wildlife tracking workshop right here at the Wells Reserve, and it was a lot of fun and it was informative. So you can always check their calendar to see if they have any upcoming events coming up for that as well. All right. So we're fortunate to share space with these three species, but some interactions with them may make us feel otherwise. Coyotes and foxes and wolves typically try to avoid humans, human activity. However, interactions can occur when humans intentionally or unintentionally create an opportunity, especially during breeding and pop or kit rearing season. I've heard a lot of stories from people who love watching the foxes den on their property year after year, who will watch coyotes in field eating mice and other rodents, and then photographers who just like to watch and take pictures of these animals. Unfortunately, not all of these interactions are viewed positively. 
individuals who have pets or livestock that are either injured or killed by wild canids are understandably upset by their presence, or at least, if not their presence, at least their particular actions. But it's important to understand why animals interact with humans before taking action, including lethal control, which can often be ineffective, expensive, and unnecessary. But it's a common solution because it takes care of the problem in that moment, and that's what we like. We like to just solve something. But if we don't make an effort to understand what led to that interaction or that circumstance, we may not be able to prevent it or solve future interactions. So the purpose of this slide here is just to give you a little bit of a comparison between human fox interactions and human coyote interactions. And these are the only numbers I could find from the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. So let's take a look at the fox interactions first. Although, sorry, I did wanna make note that Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife did note that reported human coyote interactions don't occur as often as interactions with other species, but coyotes still get a lot more negative publicity for some reason. All right, so let's take a look at foxes. So again, 2021, you can see that there were over 500 calls relating to red foxes versus only 37 relating to gray foxes. And unfortunately, there was a rabies outbreak of foxes in the Bath region and not too, not too far back in 2018 to 2020. In comparison, you have coyote interactions, what IFW labeled as verified coyote and verified fox interactions. 1994, 1995, out of over 400 animal complaints, only 19 were verified to involve coyotes. Whereas in 2019 and 2020, out of over 300 animal complaints, only three were verified to be related to coyotes. So let's, see. oh, and sorry. And since 1933, there have only been four confirmed cases of rabies and coyotes and no documented coyotes attacks on humans in Maine, you know, unlike the foxes. I'm not picking on foxes, it just happened to be how it rolls, right? So let's see. And while there are certainly valid concerns about humans and wildlife interacting, misinformation or myths can influence negative perceptions about these species before an interaction even occurs. So here's just a handful of myths that, perceive, uh, that influence how people perceive these species. So the first one, coyotes howl when they've made a kill. Yes, they certainly do vocalize, whether it's to locate another family member or announce their presence to another coyote family group. But if you have food and you want to look for more food, it's not really smart to advertise your presence because you lose that element of surprise to make another kill. Similarly, if you have a predator in the area or you know of predators in the area that may come and steal your food, you don't really want to advertise that you have something that someone else may want to come and take. The second one, coyotes luring dogs away from you in order to bring them to a pack to kill it. Um, Dogs, coyotes, wolves, foxes, they all are naturally curious and they may approach one another to try to figure out if there's a threat there or not. But if a coyote becomes alarmed and it decides to retreat and run off and a dog takes that as an invitation to play or they just don't realize what's going on and they give chase anyway, the coyote may feel like it's in danger and may feel the need to protect itself and or family members that may need to be nearby, <clears throat> as we would do if we were in that situation. Sorry, whoops. Okay, so allowing our pets to interact with or antagonize wildlife just puts us all in a bad situation. The third one, if you see a coyote or fox out during the day, they're likely rabid. So coyotes and foxes and wolves, typically more active at dawn and dusk, but seeing them during the day is not necessarily a confirmation that they're sick or that something's wrong, especially during pup or kit rearing season when they're out trying to feed those hungry growing puppies, they're out more frequently. And sick animals generally tend to show some kind of sign that they're not well, whether it's disorientation, stumbling, or just being unnaturally bold. So again, not necessarily confirmation, but I understand based over the years um, how people are concerned when they do see one out when they don't expect to. And then the fourth one, coyotes and foxes are a danger to humans. 
Again, they're naturally wary of people. However, if they are being fed or they, that fear isn't reinforced, they may come closer than we care to have them. So they have approached people, they have bitten people, but most encounters are usually preventable and statistically unlikely. And this seems like a really random comparison, but according to the Humane Society of the United States, you're far more likely to be killed by a golf ball than you are to be bitten by a coyote. Again, seems like a really random comparison, but. So all three species are valuable members of our ecosystems and they provide free services for us humans, such as rodent control, um, helping to reduce the spread of Lyme disease, carrying cleanup and supporting biodiversity. But how do we decrease our chances of a negative interaction occurring with them? For starters, please don't do this. They may love milk bones, they may want to see what you have in your hand. They may look like our pets. They may even sort of act like our pets, but they are not. So please do not feed them. <laughs> it's essential that humans and food are not connected. And I believe that most people have really good intentions. We just sometimes inadvertently create um, issues by providing food or shelter for animals. So changing both human behavior and the behavior of the animals is key to decreasing those negative interactions between us. And this graphic is from New York, but it applies to here and elsewhere. Just tips on how to live a little better. And of course, this is just for coyotes, but again, it applies to other species as well. So reducing or removing food attractants, whether that's securing trash or compost bins, um, not leaving pet food outside, replacing uh, bird feeders with wildlife friendly native plants. Uh, let's see what else we got there. Making the area less hospitable. So, if you're able to put up fencing, uh, motion activated lights. If you have items that make loud noises, you see an animal come, uh, whether it's an air horn, although I don't know how many neighbors might appreciate that, but whistles, uh, pots and pans, just anything loud or if an animal is coming too close for comfort, squirting it with a water hose to show that it's not welcome there. Repairing broken fences is important. Blocking access under buildings or under human structures before spring and baby season so they don't settle in there and have their young there and then are there for a longer period of time than you would like. Uh, livestock and poultry enclosures, making sure they're strong and secure, particularly at night if you're able to corral everything in at night for that protection, that's a great option. And then of course, is being a responsible pet owner. Again, I believe most of us really try to do our best when it comes to this, but containing and watching small pets, um, trying to keep cats inside. If you're walking a small dog, a small pet, try not to have a leash that's any longer than six feet, just in case you need to scoop them up quickly if you feel like they're in danger. And then avoiding early morning or late evening walks when these animals are most active. And I'm guilty of this one. Uh, I do love my early morning walks, me and my dog. However, um, I've learned to be extra vigilant because there've been two instances where I was surprised by a coyote nearing, nearby. One was behind us on the trail and I didn't even know it, just happened to turn around and see it there. And another was in the tall grass. Neither approached us, they just kind of checked us out and went on their way. But it was a wake up call for me to realize that, okay, I really need to pay more attention when I'm out and about. Okay. But even if we did everything right and everything possible, we still can't totally eliminate their presence because you just may have individuals traveling through or they may be attracted to another resource nearby that you're just not aware of. But the best we can do is just show them that it's in their best interest to stay away from humans. So on that note, and this is not the most uplifting of topics, but here are just a few of the most common causes of death for our canids here in Maine. Some are avoidable, some are not. Maine has a regulated closed hunting season, hunting and trapping season, sorry, for foxes. And there are two separate trapping seasons for coyotes. Uh, unfortunately, coyotes are also subjected to unlimited year round daytime hunting as well as a night hunting season. And then related to those are wildlife killing contests, um, the predator killing program, which is meant to kill uh, what are labeled as nuisance or pests, or to try to inflate the deer herd. Um, I couldn't find figures for foxes, but I did see that in 2020 and 2021, 
It cost over $61,000 to kill 276 coyotes as part of this predator killing program. So I'm not intimately familiar with it. So there may be more information that's available, but that was what I could find at this point. And then related to those, the final thing is the wanton waste law. So Maine has a law that prohibits a wild bird or a wild animal that is wounded or killed while hunting. <clears throat> Uh, prohibits wasting. I missed the key word there, didn't I? And they define waste as intentionally leaving a wounded or killed animal in the field or the forest without making a reasonable effort to retrieve and render it for consumption and use. Um, for some reason, I'm not sure the, the reasoning behind this, but coyotes are exempt from this law, so they don't have that level of protection that's offered to other species. So then we go on, vehicular collisions. If you haven't had a direct interaction like this where they just dart out in front of you and there's nothing you can do, I'm sure you know somebody who has. Uh, predation, large birds of prey will sometimes go after coyotes, foxes, they're young. Uh, rodenticides, toxic to both wildlife and the environment, unfortunately. And then like our domestic dogs, these species are also susceptible to parasites and disease, including sarcoptic mange. And that leads us to our next section. So I placed the slide here just to give us a second because the next two slides have some unpleasant images. And if you really don't want to see them, I totally get it. But I just wanted to give people a moment to click out in case you don't want to. So sarcoptic mange is an infestation of a mite that will lay its eggs and burrow into the skin. And it causes intense itching, scabbing, secondary lesions, hair loss, uh, and ultimately death if it's not treated. And sarcoptic mange was intentionally introduced to wild populations of coyotes and wolves in order to kill them or as a predator management tool uh, way back. I don't have an exact year, but it's been a while. So I'm going to click now. So if you don't want to see this, I just want to, again, give you a heads up. So we'll start with our little red fox here. And you can see this poor little thing. These animals, animals suffer greatly when they have mange. So you can see some of the crusting on its ears, its eyes, its nose. It's itching, it's got those open wounds. Can't thermoregulate because of the hair loss, so it's not able to stay warm, which affects its hunting and affects its eating, and just leads to a slow, terrible death. It's great if you can trap these animals, if you happen to see one. Uh, if, when they're sick though, they can be difficult to trap. It took me about eight hours to trap one one day and it was trapped in a culvert and I still couldn't get it out. So I needed help from a wildlife rehabilitator who, great resources. If you happen to see an animal in trouble like this, they are fantastic to um, do what they can to help you. And if you can't trap them, and it's totally understandable, they're wild animals, they will move, they will hide. There is the option to leave out medicated bait in the hopes that they will get some of it on board to help alleviate some of that suffering. So then we move on to our little coyote here. The Millstone Wildlife Center took this little guy in. You can see the open wounds when they first got it, ribs poking through, losing hair. And granted, it's not an overnight recovery. It takes weeks for these guys to recover, but you can see some of the fur has come back. It still has that rat-like tail, but it's gaining more weight. It's getting its fur back. It's recovering. So sarcoptic mange doesn't have to be a death sentence if you're able to corral them and get them the help that they need. So now we're going to shift gears and we're gonna talk about the final section for the canid research. So this statement, all Maine wildlife are a, public, are a publicly owned resource held in trust by the state for the benefit of all Maine residents, jumped out at me while I was reading a Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife document. And it's part of the reason I decided to move forward with my own canid research, because it will also support what Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is trying to do. So there was some research done on our coyotes and foxes here in Maine in the 1980s and the 1990s. IFW or the Inland Fisheries of Wildlife also did their own genetic study in the early 2000s. But the only other research I could really find was a study done in 2020 and it related to isotopes and diet and foxes and coyotes. And I haven't really been able to find much other, other than that. 
So that lack of research, that lack of knowledge really leaves a gap in our understanding of these animals and what they're doing and how they're moving around and so many other things. So it's important to learn more about them and instrumental to meeting some of the objectives that IFW has set in order to move forward with living with these guys, right? So the first is part of the goal or one of the objectives I should say is to increase public's acceptance or if not acceptance, at least the awareness of the value of our coyotes and our foxes here in the state. Create public learning opportunities about them such as this one here today, thank you, um, and outreach materials. Conduct disease surveillance like sarcoptic mange, um, rabies, anything else that they may be affected by that we're just not aware of right now. And also tracking and evaluating reports related to coyote and fox interactions and understanding what types of responses are occurring out there. All in an effort to ultimately understand more about our canids and to reduce human canid conflicts <clears throat> in order to find ways to coexist. And that's where this research comes into play. So Canids of Maine project was launched right at the end of last year and data is collected via the iNaturalist app, if anyone's familiar with that, as well as on the Facebook page or through the Facebook page. And the current or more immediate goal is to create a database of sightings of and interactions with foxes and coyotes in order to look at their body conditions, their behaviors, where they are, and areas that where there might be potential issues. If you're already on iNaturalist, you can simply share any images or audio files with the project itself on there. If you're not, it's easy enough to create an account, but I do recommend that if you share any, any files or images with the iNaturalist project to obscure the location, and that's primarily for the safety of the animal. <clears throat> However, if you, even if you obscure the location, there is an option to allow just the project to see the locations for data purposes. So you can use that option as well. So any images, any audio files, whether they're collected from a photo, um, a camera, a trail camera, camera trap, game trail, um, people refer to them with multiple phrases. So any of them, past, present, future, boxes and coyotes in Maine that are shared to this database will be super helpful and super appreciated. So please don't hesitate to either share them on here via Facebook or by an email, which I will share with you in just a moment. And so the plan with this research, it's starting here, but the plan is to expand it, include other areas of research such as diet and genetics in collaboration with others. And that leads us to our guest speaker today, Jim Booten. So Jim mentioned a study to me that analyzed a database of over 2000 howls from 13 different canid species and subspecies and the researchers found that they could differentiate the populations from those howls. So like us, they had a dialect of sorts. And I love that he and others are doing something similar with our main canids. And so I'm going to let him give you a quick overview of that research. I will stop talking for a while and get off the screen. So it is all yours, Jim. Jim, you're muted. It's Jim's turn, so I wanted to make sure I was quiet. Jim, Find the right button. Oh, perfect. Thanks. I knew I could do it. Uh, hang on just a second. Let me get this. All right. Well, thank you, Tammy. Um, so my name is Jim Booten. I'm a filmmaker. And I live over in uh, over in Hollis, just off the Saco River up here, and um, kind of started really about ten years ago. I was um, working on moose up in a very remote pond in Maine, and um, heard what I heard in uh, in the West, uh, what sounded to me like a uh, like a wolf howls, and um, it kind of set me on this quest to, to understand what exactly was going on in the state of Maine and do we have wolves here or is it, is it coyotes and have coyotes, do they have enough DNA in them to uh, to start behaving and sounding like wolves? So um, this has kind of migrated over over time really to this, um, to this beginning of this uh, Canid Howls project as we're calling it. And it's basically a citizen science project to really, 
do as much as we can to record as many of these sort of magic sounds that occur out in the wild and try to really understand what the range of sounds are. Um, and, um, and then hopefully at some point uh, work with some um, experts in the area to really kind of understand from the basis of their calls and their howls um, what, we're, what we're seeing here. So this is kind of to supplement the, the work that's going on in the, um, you know, with DNA and so forth. So right now, currently we have uh, three volunteers uh, myself and two other folks, um, and we're monitoring three locations in the state, mostly in the western part of the state and um, and one in kind of southern Arista County, all areas that have been really active with um, with canids and um, and have a really predictable population there. And so basically what we're doing is we're listening uh, during key times of the day and recording whatever's going on in the uh, in the in the forest there. And we're using this really kind of cool new emerging sound recording technology um, called an audio moth. Um, don't know where the name came from. It's kind of a funky name, but but that's what it is. And and the moth started kind of as a project to um, help the researchers and the um, and the agencies in Belize um, understand where poaching was going on in some of these reserves. And so they developed this little device that sits there and records um, off and on all day long, depending on how you program it, to really understand the human interaction and the human effect on the, on the populations. Since they did that, the whole idea has really exploded and it's now kind of migrated into study of bats, study of insects and, uh, and other species. And it's a tool that's re it's really being used um, uh, quite a bit around the world for, uh, for researchers to really understand that the, there's a whole sound component to, uh, to, to, to what's happening out there. And so basically it's a trail camera for sound if you, if you want to think of it that way. And there's a picture of the device here on the screen. It's about uh, it's about two inches by three inches, and it just we just put it up in a tree and we and we let it sit there for uh, typically depending on how you program it, it'll run for six weeks or eight weeks, and then we go out, change the batteries, change the cards out, and um, and then just leave it in the woods and and let it let it collect sound. So what do we do with the data? So when when the data comes back, we have these SD cards that are just full of uh, sound. Um, and to actually listen to it, it would probably take you hours and hours, probably six, seven hours to, to really listen to the whole thing. So we use this uh, analysis called a spectrogram. And a spectrogram is kind of like a fingerprint for sound. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is, a, is an actual wolf howl. And um, that's what it looks like. So what we can do is put this uh, sound in a program and we can scan them really fast. Um, and, uh, and look for these kinds of sounds. And so we can actually pick out the, the interesting sounds. And uh, after you've done this for a while, you can figure out what an, what's an owl and what's a raven and, and so forth. So we go through and we analyze these uh, cards as they come in and we pick out, pick out the sounds. And, and so I think we've been at this now for in varying kind of degrees, about two years. And we have about 45 minutes of uh, howl samples. Um, some far away, some close up, some groups, and um, and everything from things that sound like uh, coyotes to things that sound very wolf-like. And so I'm going to play you um, some samples, and it kind of starts out with uh, something that sounds very coyote-like to some things that sound a little bit more um, like um, like wolves. So let me play these sounds, and then we can uh, we can talk about it a little bit.
So there you go. Some interesting uh, different sounds. Um, we love the ones that you can hear the little guys in there sort of uh, sort of joining in and, and uh, howling along with the adults. So uh, it's still a learning process for us. We're still kind of trying to figure out exactly how um, how we uh, uh, when we record and what time frames and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, it sort of, sort of follows kind of logical things where there's a lot of activity dusk to dawn. Um, as you saw, probably with the timestamp on there, some of them are two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning too. So it really kind of depends on conditions and what's what's happening in the in the local environment and what they're uh, you know what they're talking about. Um, so for you know what's next for us, um, really going to continue to monitor. We've got right now three um, three units out where we've got some more that have been purchased and we're waiting for them. Um, we're we're going to play with this idea of really trying to get two, three, four of them at locations so we can kind of get a better sense of direction on, on where these are coming from with the idea that if we can sort of understand where the rendezvous sites are and where they're active, we can uh, we can get some uh, better sound equipment over closer to, uh, to where they're active. Um, as I said at the beginning, we're also looking at uh, really uh, uh, you know, working with some Canaan researchers that are researching in this area to really kind of help us, help guide us, and and also to provide information for them on the, on the kinds of things that are uh, that we're hearing uh, in our Canaan world. And we're also playing a little bit with modifying these audio moths, trying to put better microphones in them, put better batteries, so that, so they last uh, they last longer and longer. Um, so that's the project. It's it's pretty interesting. It's uh, it's very much kind of in its um, in its infancy. So uh, uh, a bit of a, a bit of a work in progress. Um, before I jump out, um, Tammy, I, I I don't think I've ever showed you this video. Um, and talking about uh, um, uh, foxes and trees, I shot this two years ago, and these are uh, these are two spring kits um, that were very very comfortable in trees. Their mom. It's not in this video, but their mom is up above them, who's climbed up on this tree, and these little guys decided that they were going to go up and visit visit mom. And uh, and although they don't quite have the uh, have the skills that the uh, that the gray foxes do, it's amazing what kind of skills the, the little red foxes can have. And they were up this they were up about twenty five thirty feet up in the air when uh, when I shot this. So um, pretty uh, pretty amazing behavior. And they all made it down just fine. <laughs> nice, that's so cool. Good footage. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. So I I need to wrap up. Don't I? Let's see. Uh, let me get this back up here. Okay, so I used to love the coyote cartoons. Um, I know they were probably a little more violent as kids than we really would have liked, but I always enjoyed watching him and I always appreciated his interest in science and art and reading because I like the same things, but I don't know if anyone ever really gave him credit for that. But the purpose of this slide here is to share this resource with you, Animal Help Now. I'm sure there are other or similar resources, but I've had a little bit of experience with this one, so I just wanted to share it. If you happen to see an injured or sick animal and you aren't sure where to take them or who to call, if you type in or share your location with this app on your phone, it will give you a list of potential places around you that may be able to help you out with what you're dealing with. So again, just wanted to share that in case somebody may find that of use. So today we covered just a little bit about the canid species in general. Uh, we touched on some human canid interactions and I introduced you to the canid research project. So I hope you found it informative or interesting and have come to the same conclusion or have come to the conclusion, I guess, um, that our canids aren't villains, they aren't vixens, but <clears throat> excuse me, like us, they're just simply, simply trying to survive in the only way that they know how. So I wanna give a huge thank you to all of you who took the time out to attend today. And again, I apologize for the lateness of the start due to my technical issues, but again, truly appreciate you being here. Huge thank you to the Wells Reserve for graciously hosting this presentation and for Jim for taking the time to come in and share his research with us too. Pretty cool and I look forward to what he learns. If you have any other questions or you just wanna learn more about the project in general, I just wanted to share my website here. 
email here if you want to reach out with questions. Canids of Maine project is on Facebook and on Instagram. And if you scan this QR code over here, it will take you directly to the project on iNaturalist. Oh, and I should mention, I suppose, uh, last year I published a children's book that's about a little girl and a coyote, just meant to be fun and lighthearted, but it comes with a free educator's guide that can be downloaded from my website. If anyone's interested in that, and you can purchase the book on Amazon or directly from me if there's any interest with that. So again, huge thank you, and I'm going to stop sharing.